Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al Ahzab, Surah 33, O you who believe, fear Allah and speak a straightforward word. If you do this, Allah will rectify your actions and forgive you of your sins. And whoever obeys Allah and his messenger has already achieved a great achievement. As to what follows, we mention the hadith, the saying of the Prophet wasallam, who said the best guidance <coughs> is the guidance of the Prophet wasallam. That is the best guidance. There is no knowledge on the face of this earth that did not come through one of the MBA. I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's the science of writing. Reading, it came to us by means of one of the prophets. So the best guidance is the guidance of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the most evil of affairs are newly invented matters in the deen. And every newly invented matter is an innovation. And every innovation is a strain. And every strain is an the hellfire. You know the amazing thing about this statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Today is one of the most misunderstood statements of the Prophet. Because the word that's used is kulu, which generally, generally means every. And so some people who don't know better say that every single Solitary innovation is a strain, and every strain is in a fire, and every etc. This is what you have to understand is as Imam An Nawawi Rahimahullah mentioned, this is what's called Amun Maqsus. This is general speech. And I'm going to give you a few examples of it in English. If you, let's say, come from a place like Atlanta, Georgia, or Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and you moved around Pittsburgh, you can say, man, there's no black people in Pittsburgh. Or, let's say you come from a place like New York City, or L.A. You say, man, in Pittsburgh, there's no Spanish people here. Because in New York, you have whole sections of the city where you have Spanish people. You have Washington Heights. You have Spanish Harlem. You have the South Bronx. And so all these places are big. You have Corona and Queens. Nothing but Puerto Ricans, Dominicans, and very other different uh, categories of Spanish people. In Pittsburgh, you don't have that. So you can say there's no Spanish people in Pittsburgh. You would be correct. But you may say, wait a minute, I know some Spanish people in Pittsburgh. I know brother such and such. I know such and such. Of course, that's general speech. It's not absolute. And so this is the type of speech. You have to take your sneakers off, brother. Right? And in the Quran and in the Sunnah of the Prophet, وسلم, the speech of the Prophet, وسلم, this type of speech is used. Because what is bid'ah? What is innovation? Innovation is that which the Prophet ﷺ did not do or approve of. Or the Salaf, the first three generations of the Muslims, did not do or approve of. Uh, bid'ah is ox, it's the opposite of the Sunnah. The Sunnah is what the Prophet ﷺ did or what he approved of. That's the Sunnah. The opposite is innovation. <clears throat> so if we understood bid'ah the way a lot of people understood stand it nowadays, we would have no musahif, we would have no mushafs, the Quran and print. I'm talking about all Arabic, I ain't even talking about translations right now. We would have no Arabic, no print of the Quran. Because it wasn't gathered between uh, two covers in book form during the time of the Prophet This process was started during the time of Abu Bakr Siddiq. Take it even a step further. 
if bid'ah was understood that way, then you wouldn't have, you wouldn't know the difference between, let's say, a bad, a tat, and a that in Arabic. Why? Because the letter itself looks exactly the same. Those three letters, they look exactly the same. It's the nukat, it's the dots over and above and the number of the dots that make the difference between the letters. They did not exist during the time of the Prophet That was added later. So this is a bid'ah as well. Even more so. Fata Dhamma Kesra. A i u. Right? Fata Kesra Dhamma. Right? The vowels in Arabic. We said it, but they weren't written. They were introduced years later after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so, usually, when we talk about bid'ah, which is not the topic of the cookbook, by the way, all of this is the introduction. When we talk about bid'ah, generally speaking, there are two broad categories of bid'ah. Bid'ah is praiseworthy and blameworthy. And then many or most of our ulama have break it, broken it down into four or five categories. Bid'ah, that's uh, wajib, obligatory. And we're just giving a few examples of a, of a bid'ah that's a, uh, obligatory. Then you have bid'ah that's mandu, that's highly recommended. You have bid'ah that's mubah, it's like in the middle. And then you have bid'ah that's makruh, bid'ah tul makruha, a bid'ah that is not haram. If you do it, there's no punishment in it, but if you stay away from it, there's a reward for it, for you, for staying away from that thing. Then you have bid'ah tul muharama, a bid'ah that's haram. And that's the bid'ah that's being spoken about in this statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And like we said, we just, this is the introduction. Uh, our kutbah is not on bid'ah, but we just want to mention those things. And usually when the ulama go into the discussions, they mention a verse from the Qur'an where Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala talks about he destroyed, I believe, the people of Ad. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala that says that he destroyed them. Kullaha, all of them, everything, right? Same word as you, kullu, right? Destroyed everything. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala follows that up by saying, and in the mornings nothing was left except for their homes, etc. So in that, in that verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says he destroyed everything. Then in the next verse, he said that something was left. So that's amu maksus, that's something that's general. That's why it's important that when we take our knowledge, we take our knowledge from trustworthy people with the isnad going back to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's very important. Walhamdulillah, we're going to meet. A'udhu billahi minish shaitani rajim. Bismillahi rahman rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa afdalu salatu wa tamu taslim ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een wa radiyallahu ta'ala ala sahihi tabi'een wa ulama al-amaleen wa a'imatu al-arabat al-mujtahideen wa muqalideen wa muqalideen wa muqalideen wa muqalideen wa muqalideen Over the last week or so, a lot of Muslims in the state of Pennsylvania have been upset or at least talking about the ruling of a Supreme Court judge who struck down the ban in Pennsylvania on same-sex marriages. That's what a lot of Muslims have been talking about in Pennsylvania. All the way from Philly to Pittsburgh, that's what Muslims have been talking about. And you hear Muslims saying everything. This is crazy. How can they do that? This is an outrage. These are the signs of the last days. Oh, we need to make hijra. We need to move. We need to get out of here. Some or all of these things may be true. But for the most part, we become a real shallow people. 
I'm pretty sure it's safe to say that every one of you in this masjid right now watches the news more than I do. I think I, I, think I, I could say that with authority, and, and I wouldn't be wrong. Every single one of you watches the news more than I do. What did you think? Would you, you think this just started? This has been going on all around the country for years. The legalization of the marriage of two people of the same gender all over the country. What did you think? They were going to skip Pennsylvania? You thought they had a homosexual Jim Crow? No homos allowed in Pennsylvania? Go over there, go to New Jersey, go to Delaware, go to West Virginia, go to Ohio, stay out of Pittsburgh, stay out of Pennsylvania? That's what you thought? You thought it was going to skip us? Why are we surprised? Did your Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tell you about this? Yes, he did. Homosexuals existed for a long time. We know the story of Lut. The prophet lied. But what we're experiencing now, the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam foretold it. One of the signs of the last day, he said, is that the marriage of a man to a man and a woman to a woman. The act has been going on for a long time. The prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam foretold the marriage, nikah. He used the word nikah. So what, we, is what we're seeing, we, it should increase, increase our faith in the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But you know what disappoints me the most? This is how you can tell that we're disconnected from the Qur'an. Muslims say things like, well, if homosexual, homosexuals can get married, why can't Muslims marry or why can't we lobby the government for polygamy. Why can't, why, how come a man can't marry more than one wife if two men can marry each other and two women can marry each other and they can uh, benefit from, uh, you know, the insurance benefits and all of these things. Why can't, the, why can't the Muslims do that? See, we Muslims need to get organized. See, the homosexuals, they organize themselves. They organize themselves so, so good that even derogatory terms that's used, that's applied to them, for example, my phone right there, right? I type in homosexual. I had to add the word to my dictionary. It wasn't in there. <laughs> you know faggot's not going to be in there, right? So you say, wow, they organize so much that they, they have a strong lobby. They, they impose what they want to do on, you know, in the country, and, and they get what they want. If we do what we do, we can, if we do what they do, we can get what we want. Complete disconnect from the crowd. Complete disconnect. Number one, this is the difference between us and the homosexuals. The difference between us and the homosexuals is that the homosexuals don't wait for legislation to be homosexuals. They're homosexuals before the law is passed. You, you wait for the Kufar to give you what Allah already gave you. Allah gave you commands and permissions to do many things. But you wait for somebody else to tell you to do what Allah already told you you could do. That's your problem. You think the people who are homosexual and gay are sitting around like, you know, you know, Bob, I love you, but, you know, we got to wait till this legislation passes. I love you too, Steve. We, I just can't wait till Governor Cor Corbin passes it so we can get married. Oh, man. You, no. They doing what they're doing anyway. A lot of you, you don't, you, you don't get that. They do what they do. They've been passing, they've been engineering and rigging this thing to be conducive to their way of life since the year I was born, 1972. This is not something that just popped up in, in, you know, after 9-11 or after the year 2000 and just something new. They've been engineering this for a long time. Even before I was born. Where they took it out of the DSM that homosexuality is even a mental disorder. That was in the early 70s. Where they say it's not a, it's not a mental disease anymore. It's, it's, it's not a sickness. It's a lifestyle choice. Look at the homosexuals. 
When I was growing up, it wasn't cool to be gay. No, you got, if you're old enough, you, you got beat up, you got made fun of, you had to move. You know, it wasn't safe. You could you lose your life. I can even give you examples of my own self growing up as a young child. It was areas where there was a lot of homosexuals growing up. And we said, let's go beat up some homos. Let's go to the village. I grew up in New York. Why, you know, like Washington Square Park around the Greenwich Village. Let's go over there. Let, let's go beat up some homos. Do it now. <laughs> you might get jumped by some homos. And then get arrested thereafter. And get charged with a hate crime. <laughs> When I was growing up, it wasn't a hate crime. You could be at work and say, you know, hey, you a faggot. So what? Say it at work now. You won't be working there. You lose your job. Look at the mindset. Look how it used to be. It was an embarrassment. It was something they even made a term for. It. You were in the closet. You were hiding your homosexuality, your deviant behavior. They didn't care. They came out of the closet. And what are the Muslims doing? The homosexuals left the closet, and the Muslims are trying to go in the closet. Any outward expression of Islam, any, any one person stands up and advocates, there will be ten Muslims telling you, you don't have to do that. You don't have to dress like that. You don't have to wear that. You don't have to do that. Keep it quiet. You mean to tell me the homosexuals follow the sunnah of the Prophet of Allah and more than you do? I mean, really, think about it. When the Prophet of Allah was in Mecca, they weren't lobbying the Quraysh to give them uh, to recognize their religion. They just wanted to be left alone to practice their religion. There's a difference. And then when the weaker ones made Hijra to Africa, they wouldn't leave them alone. They followed them to Africa, tried to get them to come back. Then they went, when they made Hijra to Medina, they still wouldn't leave them alone. They taking their property, you know, putting it on a caravan, taking it to Shem, Syria, to sell, creeping right past Medina. So they would not leave the Muslims alone. The Muslims fought when their back was against the wall. They, they wasn't like, yeah, you know, had their sword sharpened. Yeah, I can't wait to these cool for We're going to get it in. Yeah. Yeah, so I can't wait. Yeah. Can't wait to a law legalized jihad. I, I, mean, I know exactly who I'm going to kill. It wasn't like that. They fought because their back was against the wall. And, it, and it's not like now where somebody who maybe oppress you, lock you up, or do something bad against you is somebody you don't know. No. The Quraysh was family. A tribe is one big family. Umar ibn al-Qatab, radiallahu ta'ala, and he killed his father during the I mean his uncle during the Battle of Badr. He killed his uncle. Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah, radiallahu ta'ala, and who, he killed his father during the battle. But they wasn't on the battlefield fighting strangers. They were fighting loved ones. Somebody you love. Somebody that helped take care of you. Musa ibn Umayr's brother was taken as a prisoner of war, and he told the, uh, the, uh, the Ansar to tie him tight because his mother has a lot of money. Get a good money, get a good ransom for him. These are all people that they knew fighting them. We have it easy. So we need to get a little bit more in touch with the Quran. We have to get a little bit more in touch with the son of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This legislation about, you know, legalizing or or well, basically took the handcuffs off of the uh, legal system to basically make permissible uh, marriage between same sex. It shouldn't have come as a surprise. And we have to look a little bit more deeper in about, about in the thing, in, into thing, things that's going on. That's why it's, it's no accident that a lot of you hate history. A lot of you hate history. A lot of you have short-term memory. You don't, you don't remember what happened last week or last month. They, the people that's engineering these things got long-term memory. They know the history of everything that they're doing. 
And the history goes back way before I, like I said, the year I was born, I think it was 72 or 73, where they took it out to DSM, where uh, uh, homosexuality was even a mental disorder. It became a lifestyle choice at that point. Obviously, for them to do it in that year, it had to be uh, thought about and planned way before that. So what you see in now is only the tip of the iceberg, the manifestation of plans that was made when a lot of us were children and before a lot of us, like myself, was even born. What do we have for as our Muslim community? Are we thinking that long range? Or are we selfish people? We're selfish people. We're only concerned about us. We're not concerned about everybody else. We're concerned about us as an individual. When a homosexual comes out the closet, he's not thinking about himself. He's thinking about his whole so-called community. They have a Jamaat. You don't believe in Jamaat. They believe in Jamaat. Allah tells you about Jamaat in the Quran. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned Jamaat over and over and over again in the Sunnah. But you think like an individual, they think in Jamaat. Do you know that when you wear your kufi, your thaw, your kimar, your niqab, whatever, your beard, you're not representing yourself. There's some other Muslim out there that sees you and they get strength just by seeing you. It's not about you. It's about your jamaat, your whole community of Umar Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You say, well, it's just about clothes. Look at some of you thinking right now. It's just about clothes. You don't have to wear it and such and such and such and such. It's not only about clothes. This, we're not secularists. You think what you wear has nothing to do with the way you think and the way you feel? You think it's a complete disconnect? It's a connection there. Those of you who wear thob or kufi or kimo or niqab, how many times Muslims come to you on the street and say, Assalamu alaikum, alhamdulillah, it's good seeing you. I feel strong just by seeing you. You help somebody else out. You came out the closet. The homo came, they make each other strong. They stay tough now. The homos are out in force in their homosexual garb in places where it was unfriendly. It was hostile territory. What's that hostile territory? In the hood. In the ghettos. In the blocks, in the places where drugs are being slang openly. Homosexuals couldn't just walk around back in the day, sashay in, tight clothes and stuff all in the hood. You couldn't do that back in the day. At the very least, you get rocks thrown at you. Drug dealers born. Oh, man. Who that? Me a faggot. Let's get him. Right? Everywhere in the United States. Boy, now they walking through. And now what are the thugs and the gangsters and the drug dealers talking about? Well, as long as they don't, they don't try that stuff with me. You know, my man, he gay, but we still cool. <laughs> That's deep. Don't let the homos beat you and follow in the sun. How you gonna let homos beat you? They're bold and proud with their homosexuality, something that Allah cursed, something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed whole cities over. You don't understand the gravity of this thing. Where, and it was only, it was, they was only doing half of what they're doing now. It was only men and men. It wasn't women and women. Allah sent an angel to take his wing and dig up the whole city and put it up in the air, turn it upside down, and flop it down. Then that wasn't good enough. He sent down hot rocks, brimstone on top of it. To this day, they located where Sodom and Gomorrah is. Nothing grows there. No vegetation. Destroy it. So this is not something like To acquiesce or to be cool with that, it, you know, you're inviting the curse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this thing, like we said, has been going on for a long time. It just didn't just start. I don't, I don't know what y'all thought. We're just going to skip Pennsylvania? And they've been prepping and priming even the Muslims for it. A lot of our pop star Muslim leaders have switched from using. Uh, uh, Sharia-based lingo to human secularist type lingo. 
Some of them have even equated polygamy to homosexuality. Yes. They even uh, uh, tricked us into accept, accepting their divisions and demarcations of different types of Muslims. We don't need to use our, term, our own terminology anymore. We use terms like progressive and extreme and moderate. That's their terminology. When you think of progressive Muslims, they so-called, that's, that's all the so-called homosexuals they, uh, that, that claim to be Muslims, they're in that group. They're progressive, see? You know, you're backwards, they're progressive. Right? And so now you even have so-called leaders marrying two women together, Muslim leaders. Marrying two men together. And being bold about it. It's like a setup. You know, it's like, it's, it's a setup. Because you know what's supposed to happen, right? He's supposed to be dead. And the two people are supposed to be married. He's supposed to die. Death penalty. But that's like a setup. That's like Police hiding all behind the mask here, if you can see, right? And then somebody right there saying, F you, Muslim, I hate you, I dare you to do something to me. What? And you know, just talking trash, just trying to do anything to provoke you. Standing right there, near the mask, talking trash, and, and then you respond, what? What'd you say? And you go over there, you go over there and get locked up. <laughs> like, and I'll close out on this. Like in, for example, there was one masjid in Philadelphia where some Hebrew Israelites, you know, black people that claim to be Hebrew or Israelites or Jewish, they set up shop and you're familiar how they look and how they dress and, you know, how bodacious and loud they are. They set up shop right in front of the masjid. A masjid that's known for not having a problem getting their hands dirty. And so they have a propensity for disrespecting Muslims. In all the major cities, and I'm pretty sure it probably happened here too, where whenever they set up shop, if a Muslim sister walk by with a chemo, they'll snatch a chemo off. They make you have to. They don't leave you any choice but to fight. So they set up and they did this in front of the match. A couple of brothers came by and said, come on, man. Why are y'all starting trouble? We, we, don't, we don't want no problem. Why don't you just go down there? No, we ain't going nowhere. We're going to be right here. And, all right. So the Hebrew Israelites got beat up. Bad. And then they came back with a whole lot of other Hebrew Israelites. Some from out of state, some from New York, and you see all kind of out of state license plates like the gang war. But they didn't come with other Hebrew Israelites. They came with the Philadelphia Police Department. Why are you going to come by the masjid, by the Muslims that ain't bothering you, start trouble, get beat up, and then come back with police? So this is, this is what's happening. We have to understand, we have to be a little bit sophisticated here. It's not just, you know, oh, okay, let's, you know, don't waste your time trying to lobby and trying to spend money, time, and resources trying to get the same government that supports homosexuality to support polygamy and everything else that we're trying to do. It's a waste of time. Because the problem is not with you as an individual. The problem is with the lost Panawat Ta'ala. They have a problem with revelation. And we mentioned this many times. Why do you think the only two marriages that they criticize the most of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is this marriage with Aisha and this marriage with Zainab? <coughs> now you really only hear the criticism of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with the marriage of Aisha because of her age. But during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and in the early medieval period, or the late medieval period, in, in the European society, they criticized him for his marriage with Zainab, because that was his first cousin, and that was the uh, uh, former wife of his adopted son. And in their mind, the adopted son is like son. So you are you to change the rules whenever you want to, just because you want to marry somebody, just because you want to get your knocks off Mohammed, the way they say, I would be left. The amazing thing, they have a problem with those two marriages, but those two marriages came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam directly in Revelation. His marriage to Aisha was a result of a dream, which is Wahi, is Revelation. His marriage to Zainab in the Quran directly. And she used to even boast to her co-wives about that. See, he, she used to say, see, you were married to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by your fathers or your walis. I was married to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by Allah in the Quran. That's what she used to say. 
Because when when the verse came down and showed to Isaiah, that was a marriage. It was it. It was that was it. I, I, when the ayah came down, he went in the house. Marriage is over with. It wasn't no sem, uh, ceremony. So they have a problem with revelation. Stop thinking it was just with them. No, they have a problem with what you represent. They don't have a problem with you praying. Just pray at home or in the closet. They can do, you can pray all you want. You can do your Ramadan. Well, we even recognize it in a few cities, but you know, uh, just keep it in the closet. So Alhamdulillah, we should learn a lesson from this and we should get more in connected and attached with the Quran and the methodology of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Rabbana Tina Fid Dunya Hasan Wa Fila Kwaqa Hasan Wa Kina Adab Inna Allah. Alumin Hasan Wa Mumin Hasan Wa Mta Parakhi 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 Wa Mta